Hi, everyone. My name is Joey Reese. Welcome back to the Practice Center, where we talk about all things mindfulness, forgiveness, and attitudinal healing. We're here with Myra today. Um, Myra, please tell us everything that is relevant for us to know about you in the context of this conversation today. I am a life coach and a crafter, so I love to express my creativity through doing paper crafts and arts and things like that. Um, That's part of my self-care as well. But what got me started into this practice was more curiosity. I did suffer a lot from migraines every month, um, vertigo, everything, you know, that was kind of health related due to stress. And so I missed a lot of work, actually. And I didn't realize how much work I was missing until I was thrown on FMLA. (laughs) And I was like, wow, that's a lot of work I'm missing. And I guess I needed to know that I had to do something about it, because obviously, I wasn't coping well with it. Yeah. Um, So yeah, and then I Myra, Myra, (laughs) we're like four seconds in and I'm already feeling your your emotions. I'm actually okay about it now. But like, when I think about it, I'm just like, Oh, my gosh, you know, that's the place that I went. That's where I was before, you know, yeah, a life full of stress. And just now it's like, you know, I mean, going through this whole um, process, it's just helped me a lot. Um, And at first, you know, I have to admit my first group that I went in, I was laughing because the first group I went in and I came out the first session and I was like, I am not going back there. (laughs) I was talking to another participant and then we were like, oh my God, that felt pretty crappy. Like, why would we want to keep going to something like this? Right. Because we had to talk about like our grievance stories, what was bothering us. And so we were like, maybe we won't come back next week, you know? And so, you know, I thought about it for the week and I was like, okay, well, yes, my, you know, it's pretty crappy and whatever, but you know what? It must be something that I need to go through because I went to the first session and I was like, okay, I'm just going to stick it out. You know, I'll go to the next one. So then I went to the second session and um, they talked about revenge fantasies, right? And, you know, revenge fantasies, we feel like, okay, this is how hurt we are, you know, it's expressing how hurt we are, you know, because of these thoughts that we have, whether they're dark, or even positive. And so I thought, okay, that session is pretty good. Okay, so I thought, okay, I'll go back, you know, and as the sessions went through, they got better and better. Mm -hmm. And the curiosity for me um, was definitely something that I was happy to actually go through, you know, Um, I didn't, like, I didn't feel the need of like, okay, I'm not going back anymore. You know, I, I said, okay, I am going to go back because I want to learn more. I want to know the process. So getting you know, over that initial hump of telling the grievance story yes. or learning about that. After yes. that, you were like, huh, let me see. Oh, I love that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, like the big word now, you know, everybody talks about trauma, right? Yep. And so when we think about the whole trauma thing and I'm like, you know, I don't feel like I went through the capital T where we talk about the what we read about in textbooks, right? Yes. The, the physical abuse, the, you know, things like that. But then we think about like the lowercase T's of trauma and what how it, how it affects us personally. So mm-hmm. it's not... Um, where, you know, a lot of people know about what's happened to you or, you know, and maybe you don't want to be heard by other people, but you want to know that it's okay. And sometimes you just want to know that you're not alone, you know, just to feel it by yourself. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, just going uh, to distinguish that a little bit, the capital T trauma, when you say that, what do you mean? And the lowercase T trauma, like, how do we talk about it in the context of this? Because we get both stories, right? Because you yeah. are now a facilitator. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows that because I have put up a, a screenshot of your facilitation certificate right here. Yes. Um, <laughs> the lowercase two, T I think about is just this daily stuff that we go through, right? I mean, just the, the fight with the other half, you know, like I know one day, um, you know, he's going through stuff, right? And I was going through stuff. And, 
you know, he came across as, what did you do all day? And I just went, Ooh, and that like full on triggered me, you know, and I was just like, whoa, you know, and so I had to actually take a step back. And I was like, yeah, I know he's going through stuff, you know, he actually there was a death in the family. And so, you know, and I was like, well, what triggered me to bite back, you know, and, you know, having that thought, and I was like, Oh, my gosh, you know, like, that self talk in myself is like, okay, well, I, I said I was going to do this, but actually, I did not So of course, I'm sitting there blaming my own self, because I didn't do what I said I was going to do that day. Right. So just to clarify, um, the way that we articulate trauma here in the context of mindful forgiveness within uh, the practice center is that it's an experience or an event that happens that separates us from a felt sense of safety, dignity, or belonging. I mean, if we really look at that, look at in all the ways that we humans don't feel safe in our day-to-day life. Mm -hmm. Like it sucks to not feel safe. (laughs) Like there's no way around it, right? How many times do we talk about not belonging and, and nobody says that with a, a skip in their step. Nobody's like, oh, I don't belong, right? It's a detrimental thing because as relational beings, we need to belong to survive. So yeah, it, we say little T, but it's everything if it's happening to you. Yes. It's yes. your whole world, right? Exactly. Yeah. You so nobody else might know it, but it is. It's what we're going through. Right. And yours was enough where it was compounding enough that you were getting migraines, what other physical, um, how how else was it coming out for you in your physical body? So I, I had migraines at least, I would say every other week or so in a month. And I would get vertigo like once, once a month. at least. Can you describe that for people who don't, I've never had a migraine, but I do know what a headache is. So sometimes I, in my mind, I conflate the two. I'm like, a headache take an aspirin oh yeah so yeah. if I so okay you know, like if I don't take care of it I know that you know it's the um, sensitivity to bright light you know and I get really nauseous to the point where I actually start vomiting oh and my gosh so if I don't take care of it or if I if I, I and I try to sleep it off most of the time I actually had medication I tried to sleep it off I tried to do all these other things but it just it's one of those things that I just needed to sleep and just get rid of it and take the medication. So it was diagnosed, you got in, so you had external interventions to help you cope with this ongoing migraine. And then vertigo. uh, I'm like, Oh, I've been dizzy before. Like, just (laughs) sit your butt down. Um, yeah. So what is vertigo? Even that with vertigo, I didn't even know what it was. It would start first thing when I wake up in the morning. So I would, I would be like, hey, I'm not going anywhere today. I don't want to drive. The whole room is spinning. And again, too, I want to throw up. I want to vomit. I mean, I will walk around saying this stuff is magical. When we practice this stuff, it's magical. You're going to have so many different impacts. And then also I'm like, well, it, like, who am I to say that? Who am I to say that? Uh, And yet when I hear your story, when I know what I've been able to do in my own life, it feels like magic because it, 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 like the, the immobility that I felt where I'm like, God, I'm doing everything and nothing is working. Like I've, I've said that, I don't know how many times I'm doing everything and nothing is working. I feel like shit. And then to actually do the breakdown of this kind of work and to feel it working, sometimes it gets lost in translation, right? So it's not that this is an like an easy pill or that easy button and you know, on that commercial, like, oh, you go to a workshop, push the easy button. Now my life is fixed. It wasn't like that, right? No. So you talked about how it was a struggle to go, why, like, how? how is talking about this bad stuff that happened? How is that going to help? Right? How is drudging up these old stories? How is that going to help? So that's the question that I'm throwing at you. How is, how has this helped? What, like, tell us, how is this not bullshit? (laughs) (laughs) Well, definitely it's not, um, Bullshit. Um, I really firmly believe that it's helped me just even give me the language 
to understand what's processing in my mind through the steps that we learned through the workshop. I mean, if I didn't have these, there's very simple steps. We're the one that makes it complicated, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and all this stuff, but at the same time, it's like, it's really simple. And if we were to actually sit there and practice it and do it daily, which I know that I have been doing, it's like all that other stuff just kind of subsided, you know? I haven't had a migraine of a year. Yeah, it's been wow, like way less. I haven't had vertigo at all. A it, whole it's, year of no migraines. So what does that mean to you, Myra? Oh, it actually feels really good. Like I'm not, you know, stopped as far as like, Cause like my day, my whole day could be shot because of a migraine, you know, and I don't have that anymore. You know, I have this extra time to do stuff. I do what I want. It's a lot because of this practice. The first thing that really hit me when I first started was those unenforceable rules that we have on ourselves, right? We're constantly shooting ourselves and telling ourselves you know this should be this way or I always do this this way you know and Mm -hmm. that was one of the things that I realized that I was doing a lot of you know Um, I should be driving a certain kind of car because I'm a teacher or you know like Mm -hmm. those things that society put on us and now it's like eh you know (laughs) none of that really seems to matter to me anymore Um, but it's, I mean, I still have those shoulds and always, you know, but then I, I actually can kind of reflect back on it and say, Hey, does it really have to be like that? Mm -hmm. You know, what was one rule that you had that, you know, was really solid that you were now able to let go of somewhat. Do you have a one or two of those people? people should return things back to me, you know, in ways that, you know, like if I gave it to you in good condition, I expect it back in good condition. You know, um, that was because people are always borrowing things from me and sometimes I would never get it back. (laughs) Um, That seems like normal. That seems like a normal thing to think. People should yes. return things to me. So how, why is that a problem? Because I made it a problem. Of course, a lot of the things in our head and in our heart, and that's the values that we have. You know, I think about it and I was like, yeah, why do I have that? You know, and then I remember this incident. <laughs> I was young and my dad was like, um, he bought me a pair of shoes and I would drag my feet And it got to the point where I dragged my feet so much that there was holes on the bottom of the sole. And he yelled at me for that, like, you know, you should be taking care of your things. And, you know, and it was just one of those things that I just never forgot. And, you know, it's not like, again, like a little lowercase t trauma for me, because it's like, oh, you know, like, I, you know, I don't know, as a kid, you don't know these things, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I must have been in elementary school. But now that I think about it, I'm like, wow, that like carried on throughout my life, you know, and I was just like, Oh, my God, you know, I need to let that go. (laughs) So as you're saying it, you're I see the emotion on your face. So can you tell me when you think of that story? What is it that you're feeling even right now? Well, I guess I'm embarrassed to share it. That's why I'm probably crying. But at the same time, I'm laughing because it's like, oh my gosh, like I held on to that for so long. You know, why am I holding on to it? You know? Um, Yeah. And then it's like, you know, other people will probably think, why is that so like, but I guess it's when you hold on to something for so long, you know, and then you're actually able to let it go. It's so freeing. It feels so good. (laughs) Because it's those three things. It, we're all having thoughts all the time. Yes. And those thoughts are accompanied by emotions. Yes. But those of us who don't have the capacity or the skills to express it, it goes somewhere. And that internal, and when it turns inside of us, it can turn ugly or it can be a weight. So it doesn't really matter what it is. It's the unexpressed emotions 
Yes. Right. That weighs so heavily on us. So it doesn't matter if those experiences are silly, but, but I look at a little tiny young elementary school Myra who got yelled at for that. And I can imagine that she was scared. Right. The, yep. And, and, and not doing things that your father expects you to do, disappointing our parents, those are the biggest struggles humans have because <laughs> we're relational yeah. beings, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that you shared it is exactly why we do these videos because so many of us think that those stories are little and yet those stories are impacting our adult life in a way that incapacitates us from going to work some days. So it's not like, Yes. it's not that one story it's like how that story then morphs and then turns into how we exactly. live our life and grips us yes before but, I would be I would hold a grudge and I would like never talk to that person again <laughs> there it is <laughs> um you know the whole forgiveness thing to going back to that and now that somebody asked me oh can they borrow something of course I'm going to like be kind of I'm not, I'm, I didn't forget the incident, right. but then I'm also like, okay, you know what? I can, I can handle this. Yeah. So you're able to do it with more awareness and really checking in with yourself first. Yes. Yeah. Um, Myra, what else do you want to talk about in terms of this work and how it's impacted you? Because you introduced yourself as a coach. So I'm curious about how this impacts your work. Um, you also said, that you missed a lot of work. So you must have been working for somebody else. How is that going? Where is, so where does all your lives intersect and how has this work impact all of those lives? Yeah, I've always, you know, believed in multiple streams of income. So amen, <laughs> I like amen. That working, yeah. working a job and having my own business, it's helped my, my coaching practice a lot because it asks, you know, the, the right questions for people. Um, but when I really started to think about why I'm working, you know, they're, they're, my last job, I was working part time and, you know, I, I loved my coworkers. I, that's actually the only reason why I was staying, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> work didn't fuel my soul. And I just felt like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. You know, I was able to leave that and continue this journey as my as a life coach and forgiveness facilitator and I just love it because not only does it fuel me it helps other people help them gain the, these life skills that they can practice every day um how has it impacted your personal life or your relationship life and are you still yelling at your partner <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been a lot more patient that's for sure. Um, I choose my battles. I choose to be more positive about it and be grateful for the good things that are happening instead of ponder on those, those negatives, you know, and going down that rabbit hole. Have you guys talked about any changes that he's seen in you? Like, has he given you some feedback as to what he's witnessed in your journey? Yeah, he seems, he says, you seem a lot happier and you, <laughs> what did he tell me? He said, I'm happier and, cause this was a while ago. So he told me I was happier and he goes, you're not as grouchy. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, how amazing to have a less grouchy partner. Yes. We all want that, Definitely. right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. How is it to get that kind of feedback? It's funny because I never thought of myself as one of those people that was grumpy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess because outside of the home, right. You're a totally different person. Right. right. But having to live with that person, it's like, oh my gosh, really? I really was that much of a grump. Were you like, do you see <laughs> that now? I do. I really do. And just, just the thought process, even like, I would think like a negative thought and I'd actually follow that negative thought. Yeah. But now it's like with that practice of like, okay, that negative thought, but then kind of switching it over, you know, how, you know, I know Fred taught us the um, technique part and that was one of the things that helped me 
really change things. Yeah. You know, and it's always easy. It was always easier to go through that, go to that negative pathway. But now that I've actually practiced it and I know that moving it into a positive, it just, it's more of a natural and it takes up just as much energy. And actually it, it fuels me to the sense where I'm like, Oh, I feel so much better. And then it opens other pathways for me to go like, Oh my gosh, I can do this. And I can do that. You know, and all these ideas come up and it's like, Wow. <laughs> really supercharges that creative energy, right? So what it you just does. Um, does. what you were talking about is Fred Luskin, who um our the foundation of our work is coming from Fred Luskin's uh, forgiveness project. And he wrote the book Forgive for Good. And he talks about PERT. So when um Myra just mentioned PERT, it's positive emotion uh refocusing technique. So that's what you were talking about. So that allows you to settle in that present moment, acknowledge what's happening, but also then ooh, from a heartfelt center, just really open up, right? To It's the difference between like having a hose that's like all mangled, trying to pump water out of it and just taking time to like straighten the hose out. Then you don't have to turn up the faucet so much. It's going to come out the other end better when it's not all mangled and constricted. So, yeah, when we're dealing with our partners, when we go in all mangled, it's like it's it's not a pretty place to be. And you just really created more space. Yeah. And it's where, you know, when you said that, too, it reminded me of what place am I coming from? Am I coming from a place of love or am I coming from a place of fear? Right. Attitudinal healing. That's right. So that's right. Yeah. And where are you coming from more often than not, Myra? Definitely from more of a loving place. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So then what do you notice when you're working with clients and when you're holding groups? um, What are you seeing now? Because it's different when we're walking through the process for ourselves. And then when we've gotten some space and then now we're working with other people, like we continue to learn so much more, right? From working with others. So what have you learned from the facilitator's end, what have you gained? What would you like to share? The holding of space for people is super important. Like just knowing that they have a place to come to where they feel safe mm-hmm. and that they could share things. It's it's amazing, you know? And then coming from that loving place and they know that you care about them, it's like they engage so much more. You know, and people can tell that, you know, they can tell if you're faking it or not. They can tell if it's like, oh, this person is just saying this or just saying that, you know, but if you're really coming from that loving place, people can tell. Yeah. And that's what's impacted a lot. Just having the relationship with other facilitators um, within our group. Uh, I do talk to others a couple of times a week, you know, and it's nice to have that support from each other. And just knowing that even from people that I work with, even clients, you know, it's wonderful to know that there is a community of people out there that want this for others. So I really appreciate that. I'm very grateful for that too. What is it that you are working on the most in order to stay connected with others? Because we say we do this work to connect with ourselves and with others. And then with the community or the world, that's how world peace is created. When we talk, when we, when we talk about complaining, right? I always try to think about what am I complaining about, right? Because most of the times I'm probably doing it myself. Yep. <laughs> yep, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I think about it and, you know, it's nice to know that like when I'm talking to another facilitator, they're like, So I hear you saying this and you're complaining about this. And I'm like, (gasps) (laughs) of course, my my defense mechanism is to laugh. Um, And so it's it's one of those things I'm like, oh, you know, but then you have that aha moment like, oh, hello. (laughs) We've built enough trust where we can say that to one another, right? And then even with other people around me, you know, in my circle, my square squad, you know. When you look back, over these years from 2019 to now what are you the most proud of out of all the things that you can be really proud of yourself for what are you the most proud of I'm most proud of actually going through this process like it's life-changing 
I, I can't see myself not doing it, mm. you know, um, being where I am today, because without it, I don't think I would be where I am. What does forgiveness mean to you, Myra? Letting go of shit that no longer serves you. <laughs> Simply put. <laughs> and if there's another Myra out there right now who's missing work because of migraines and having vertigo and can't drive, what would you suggest would be her first step? Her first step would be to sign up for one of the workshops. Definitely learn the skills and practice them. <laughs> practice gratitude. Mm. Knowing what these, what positive and grateful things you have, you know, it kind of diminishes the negative, you know? Cool. Um, so that, that per practice that we talked about earlier is definitely one of those good practices to have. But, you know, as a life coach, we look at people at where they're at presently and take them to a more desired future that they want to be. So it's definitely sometimes we'll kind of look at the past, but then we kind of stay there a little bit, but then we definitely try to move forward from there. Okay. Looking at the obstacles. Okay. One of my coaching success stories is that, you know, I had a client who was going through a divorce. It was very hard, very bitter. Um, to the point where it was hard for her to get out of bed, picking up bad habits um, and, you know, still trying to having to take care of kids. Um, but, you know, through all of that, you know, we've worked together. Um, she's definitely turned her life around. She's um, she went back to school. She got a job, spent a lot of time with the kids um, and one of her family members came back to me and said, thank you. Thank you for giving me my daughter back, you know? So, wow. Yeah. So awesome. Love it. Wow. Well, we can't end on a better note than that. <laughs> oh, wow. Thanks everybody for watching. And you know how to get a hold of Myra or reach, we can find her through the practice center as well. So thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Bye.